We're back and we're moving into our first conversation for this morning. I am joined at this time by Leader of the Opposition and Leader of the People's United Party, Honorable John Briseño. Good morning. Good morning, Marlene. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me over this morning. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being here. And of course, uh, there's quite a bit going on and a lot to catch up on. <laughs> do we have enough time? <laughs> well, we're going to make the most okay, of it. Good. I do have to say that much. So. Let's just start off, I think, with, with what is uh, the predominant issue as it should be, which is the upcoming referendum on whether or not to go to the ICJ. And uh, to start off, we know that the People's United Party's position is officially a no, to the up, no in the upcoming referendum. But one of the things when we look back into uh, how the conversations have unfolded, uh, your personal position at one point in time was essentially saying yes to the ICJ. And I want to start off by having, uh, giving you the opportunity to clarify how you separate your personal position from the party position. Well, the first thing we need to do, Marlene, is to correct what you earlier said mm -hmm. um, about the party's position as being no to the ICJ. When we took out the People's Declaration, that was a carefully crafted declaration that we did. It's a declaration that represents the views of the party. Mm -hmm. I have been the only leader that have gone to all 31 constituencies and I've consulted and I listened to what our people are saying and what their concerns are. Of course, there are some hardliners that are saying no and there are some others that are saying yes. Mm -hmm. But the majority of our people are saying, well, we don't know enough. We don't trust what the government is telling us. We believe that the um, educational campaign is not well resourced, it's not balanced, we're not hearing enough from them. There were concerns about um, the voters list, you know, people can't get a voters list, they can't can get the ID, they can't get registered, they can't get, we, we know that the Maritime Zeroes Act that we need to amend, we need to re amend the People's Representation Act to allow to have a standalone referendum. So we have a number of issues. Mm -hmm. And because of that, what the party have said that we are asking the government to postpone. And if the government refuses to postpone, then we have no other option but to ask our supporters to vote no. What is it that we want, Marlene? Do we want a referendum or do we want to get it right? I believe that we want to get it right. Mm -hmm. I believe that we have one good shot at it right um, to uh, going to uh, whether we make that decision on the for the right reasons, whether we want no. to go yes or no. So no. that is what this declaration is saying. No, there's been a response to this already, and the Prime Minister has clearly said he is not going to postpone of course the not. referendum. He, you know, so Prime Minister believes in a king. Currently, what is taking place is uh, that the perception is that the PUP is holding a no position. Why? But because I, I the Prime Minister refuses to listen to us, so then we have no other option yeah. but to say no. When you stated publicly that you do believe <clears throat> that this dispute needs to be settled in the ICJ. And the party has a position now saying, if we don't postpone, we'll vote no. How do you separate the two, your personal view, from what the party position is at this time? It's easy, Marlene. Marlene, um, I have so many functions. I have different rule, uh, or roles that I play in my life. Yes. I have a role as a business person and a role as a leader of the party. As a business person, I can go into my business, and my brother and I, we, we own the company. We could decide this is what we're going to do, and everybody has to follow. Mm -hmm. In uh, an organization, the People's United Party, I am not the owner of the People's United Party. I am its leader, and I represent the views of my party. I went out, I consulted, I listened mm -hmm. to all 31 constituencies. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, everybody is telling you, we don't feel we're ready to have a referendum on the 10th of April. And these were the concerns that, were ref that are reflected in the People's Declaration. So unlike other leaders, or unlike certainly the, the Prime Minister was had to be twisting arms if with people in his party, we went and we consulted. And you can't go wrong when you listen to the people. And all people are telling us, we don't think we're ready on the 10th of April until we could address these fundamental issues that are of concern not only to our party supporters, but to most citizens in this country. Now, 
when you go out on your listening tour, because this, this campaign, and I think you can agree, has clearly become divided along party lines. <clears throat> When you go out on your listening tour and you're talking to PUP supporters, there was already a clear yes vote coming out of the United Democratic Party. How sure are you that this is not just siding with the opposition because the government has a particular position? No, it's not. I can genuinely look at you and tell you that as leader of the People's United Party, I tried, I tried working with the government Many times we went to the Prime Minister, we made some solid recommendations as to how we can move this forward, and they didn't listen. From early I said, we need to move this out of the political fray. Let's out of our national team. Let's put the professionals to deal with it. Take it away from the Prime Minister, from the Foreign Minister. Take it away from our um, shadow Foreign Minister. They deal with it, they report to them, they report to us. And so have the professionals deal with it internationally because we're losing internationally. Um, Guatemala has been doing a better job than we are internationally, the PR campaign. So we're supposed to have a team, just as what we did when we were going for independence. We should have taken that very same strategy, work internationally and also work the people. Again, they refused. When I was telling them from early on, we cannot allow the naysayers to set the agenda, or to set the pace, or to, to put things into people's minds, they don't listen. And I've been telling them over and over and over, and they don't listen. We, when we try to, we, I set up what we call a, a very powerful um, team to advise me on the issue of Belize, Guatemala. Um, we wrote a protocol for the SARS stone. We wrote it. They asked us, wrote, write the draft. We had the draft. We gave it to them. When we attempted to, to present that in Washington, um, I'm sorry, at our ministers, uh, the foreign ministers of Guatemala and Belize, our foreign minister told, our representative, stop. We're not going to talk about that right now. They invite you when they want to meetings, and when they don't want, they don't invite you. Now, you said that Guatemala has a better PR campaign. What are you referencing? Well, they are going around internationally saying, look at what we're doing. We're trying to solve this. Look at how they're, they're shooting our people at the Chiqui Bull, they, you know, and they, they, um, all that they're doing to our people. Knowing that they're the ones that are arresting us, not us. And we should have been doing a much better job. So we're talking being about the, inter the internationalization of the issue. Of course, we've done a terrible job. Now, when you, you understand very clearly how this works. And I think it, when it comes to issues of the Sarstoon Protocol and some of the other <clears throat> things that you are asking for or that the People's United Party has asked for, we've asked representatives of government as to why the Sarstoon Protocol has not been put in place. And very simply, this has to be agreed upon by two countries. This is, this is the explanation <clears throat> being given to us. How do you, I mean, you understand how the diplomatic realm works. P Belize so, can say we want the protocol. What other avenues could we have used to get the protocol in place if we can't get Guatemala to agree? Well, the first thing we would have said is we're going to suspend the talks about whatever we go to the ICJ until we have, we, we have a certain protocol. We can't let them bully us. And then we can go and talk to the international community and say, look at what Guatemala is doing. They're illegally taking over the Sarah Stone. It is very clear in, in the 1859 treaty. It is very clear by possession over 200 years. It is very clear by custom that we have a, a border. And a border takes a life onto itself, as the ICG have pointed out. So we, have been, we should have been much more stronger um, with, the, with the Guatemalans. As opposed to, it seems that we're trying to appease and to so try to stay friendly. We have to. They're taking over a part of our land. We should have, from the early onset, if you don't want to sign a protocol, we're not going to discuss the ICG. Okay. Now let's talk about the foreign minister's declaration. And uh, we have seen the <clears throat> former leader of the People's United Party. We've seen. Uh, Lisa Schumann and Assad Schumann sign on to the declaration, <coughs> and uh, Eamon Courtney has called it, I believe, a, a circus. What's your perspective on this? And one thing I really want to make clear, Said Musa was the leader of the People's United Party. At one point, the People's United Party entrusted Lisa Schumann and Assad Schumann to take up the helm and move this process forward. These people, who your party and your supporters entrusted, are saying, yes, we do have to vote yes on going to the ICJ come April 10th. 
I can't speak for them. I can't speak for my party, the party that I represent. And what we're saying, we're not fighting with Lisa Schumann, we're not fighting with Assad Schumann, we're not fighting with the former prime minister. They believe strongly that we should go to the ICG and they believe strongly we should go on the, on the 10th of April. Our party is saying that we believe that there are a lot of unanswered issues that need to be addressed before we go to have a referendum to decide whether we want to go or not to the, to the, um, to the ICG. And we simply are not going to be ready for the 10th of April. We have thousands of Belizeans that want to get registered, but because of the crisis that we have at the Vital Statistics Office, they can't get a birth certificate, so they can't get registered. You're disenfranchising these people. We need to give them opportunity to be able to get on that role. What would a citizen do? That, for instance, um, let's take you as an example. You want to vote. Your passport is expired. You have a birth certificate. You can't find your birth certificate. You go to apply for the birth certificate and tell you, well, I can't find your birth certificate, so you can't get registered. I recommend it to the Prime Minister. Why can't we use the social security card as an ID? So the social security, for those that have applied for a social security card, know that they have to go through a lengthy process to get a social security card to ensure that you are a citizen of this country. We should have been able to use that. It would have made it so much easier. But I guess maybe the, opposite, the, the, the government believes that, they, that we don't have, well, finances are very tight for us and we have to get birth certificates, which are at a cost. And it will be easier for them and they have access to, to vital stats. So anyway, point is, that is their That's position and yeah. I respect that. That's their position. Our position is different because we have to look at all that, that, that has to take place before we have um, a referendum on the 10th of April. Now, you would agree that this is the biggest decisions, decision that any Belizean citizen will have to make. And when the divide becomes drawn along the lines of the different parties, it leaves people in an uncomfortable position. We've seen more and more where the campaign has been a lot of mudslinging. We have uh, uh, the, the representation of the uh, fa father of our nation, of, of national hero Philip Colson, uh, being used in the campaign. And it seems to be spurring, uh, spurring more and more uh, just a clear divide in, in, in how to view this issue. I want to ask just in terms of the campaign, in taking a position uh, as strong as you have, are, are you satisfied with how we're moving towards what is the most important decision for any Belizean? No, I'm saddened by it. I'm saddened by it. Um, because as I said, we have genuinely tried to work with the government. And every time we try, they push us back. We try, they push us back. We try, they push us back. So eventually we felt that they don't want us to work with them. We feel as if we are a part of an appendage to them. When we were in government, give, to give credit to the former um, prime minister, he ensured that we included the United Democratic Party in every single process, every meeting, every decision, they were a part of it. We went even so far to, to appoint a UDP as an ambassador, former, um, well, the late, the late um, Alfredo Martinez, Alfredo Martinez from, from Orange Rock. And of course, I came out with a lot of fire from Orange Rock. I said, how oh, you could do this for a UDP? I said, the man is competent. He's a good man. He's from Orange Rock. So what if he's a UDP? We supported that. Have you seen that in the UDP? Have they been doing that? They have not. They have not. So, and then, one more point. Who do you see are out there canvassing for the yes vote under the guise of the, of the referendum unit? They are all UDP operatives. Every single one of them are UDP operatives that are being paid from the government coffers. So what do you expect our people to say? Mm -hmm. But so even, don't blame us for well, making it political. I was going don't to say, blame us for making it political. There, there can, you feel there's no culpability in, in separating yourself from the process? The, the People's United Party was involved in the bipartisan commission when and we there was still a want to be involved of the special agreement. And we still want to be involved. But at one point, 
the People's United Party chose not to participate at a certain period of time. I can't remember the exact year now. I can speak but for you as the leader. But it was after the signing of the special I agreement. Can, I am speaking to you as the leader of the People's United Party. Every time that I've been the leader of the party, we have cooperated. I, I said it out early in my, when I became the leader in, in 2016 that we are not going to allow this to be, become political. I've said it to the Prime Minister, I've said it to the media, and I continue to say it. But if, as you, you know, say you, are, you push out your hand for shaking your hand, and they, they don't have it, eventually you are bring down your hand. And we have been trying, I can genuinely tell you that we have tried. Now there are certain people in our party that from the media say, oh, we don't want that. It's a large organization. Over 67,000 people voted for us. So please, we're going to have different views. But the views of the party has always been, we will not play politics with this issue. I want to move the conversation forward because there's another important uh, uh, development that is taking place. The challenge to the special agreement, we understand, was supposed to go to the court yesterday. <coughs> Um, you are part of the party that will be taking this to court. I want you to explain to me, the primary question I think is, from 2008 to 2019, why are we doing this now, one month before the referendum? It's very simple. From 2008, Senator Courtney has been saying that this has to go to the House first. In 2010, he gave a, a, a presentation um, at the City and York, York Lecture Series Again, pointing out that this has to go to the house first. Um, we left it in the hands of the government. I mean, they felt that they have to, they, they felt that they, would, they don't have to go to the house. Um, and again, we've been bringing these, uh, these issues to his fore, to, to his attention. If the government was serious, they could have had from the early on, get some of our best PUP liars and best CDP liars. Let's look at it and let's see what if there are any weaknesses, are we missing anything? Mm -hmm. Even in 2008 when the Prime Minister, this was presented in the House, the Prime Minister said, when he, they tabled it, the, the, the door was not brought for legislation. When he tabled it, he said that this has to come to the House. Yes, we will respect the will of the people, but this has to come to the House. And you can look it up in your records. Um, <clears throat> I just read that yesterday to, as a reminder. Um, and he never did, he never did. And we have been telling him, postpone, let's get all the issues that we have to address. Mm -hmm. The amendment of the Referendum Act, the amending of the Maritimes Act, the amending of the um, People's Represent Representation Act, correcting this issue, it's a simple issue, go to the House, we vote for it, to have the referendum, to vote for it, whether to go or not to the ICG. So but it is his pride that gets to the government, to the Prime Minister. So that challenge will be brought when? Well, to, um, today we, we, we're filing Mm -hmm. And we will be asking the, the Supreme Court to quickly listen to it because we have um, a limited time. Um, what are you asking the court? To stop the referendum for us to correct the process. It's to a simple process. if it's necessary to go to the House of Representatives or yes. to give time to go to the House of um, Representatives? For, for them to decide whether we have to go to the House of Representatives. See, as, as, as we put in the, as we have in the letter now, mm -hmm. I just quote it to make sure. Sent to the Prime Minister I yesterday. sent a letter to the Prime Minister yesterday to just alert you. I think it's a, it is the right thing to do. I said, I've been advised that there is serious doubt whether the Minister of Foreign Affairs had the power to legally and bind Belize to the special agreement and the protocol without prior legislative approval. Additionally, a review of the Referendum Act reveals that it does not provide for the holding of a binding referendum as required by Article 7 of the special agreement. We understand there's a separation of powers. We have the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. The executive, as the foreign minister, can go and, and negotiate treaties and, and, and agreements and so forth. And then they can sign on to it internationally. But for, for it to become national, it becomes a part of our laws, it has to come to the House and make the appropriate legislation. Quick example, when we sign on with um, the extradition treaty with, with the United States, we had an extradition extradi treaty um, law in Belize. We had to go, um, when we signed that, several months later we had to come to Belize to amend it, to include that as part of the, so there's clear separation of power. In this case, they have signed on, they brought it to the Senate, 
So the Senate approved, but the Senate does not have the authority to change the law. It starts in the House. And when it comes to issues of the Constitution, they need at least two thirds of the vote of, of the um, 31 um, members of the House to vote for it. Majority. And that does not have, I know it's so ironic that the Prime Minister could have done it between 2008 and 2012, but he fell asleep. Because he had the majority of at that course. time. Now, you, you keep on mentioning that there are, part, that there are uh, stipulations. If there are changes, if the voters list or the registration issues are sorted out, uh, that in the referendum until people feel they're better educated on this issue, um, and a number of other things, which I want you to outline very clearly. But my question is, you have members in your party the Southern and Western Caucus specifically, that they're not no under these conditions. They're no, no way to the ICJ. Even if you get all of these uh, requests that you're making, even if you come together in a bipartisan approach with the government and, and you work on these issues, get this arson protocol in place, do you really think you can convince the rest of the party to come on board and eventually move towards a path to the ICJ? Well, remember, it's not only the individual, but the people on the ground. And I believe that with a properly, um, <clears throat> a proper campaign and a bipartisan approach, I think a lot can be done. It has not happened. Is the door still open for a bipartisan approach? Of course. We want to work with the government. This is, as you said, one of the most important decisions we are going to make since independence. But when we were, when we were moving to independence, if the father of the nation took, what, 31 years to be able to get to yes, for people to say yes. And even then, even at that time, where the United Democratic Party was saying, no, we have to wait at least another 10 years. So we, we have been mentioning the ICJ. People really, that was something over there. People don't really knew about it. So we have not done enough to educate. We could have already had why we're supposed to go to the ICJ, the pros and the cons and everything. In the, in the curriculum in the schools, that all four farmers, all six farmers, all UB students need to take it many times over. That by the time they get out, they really understand the issue, that they in turn can educate their, their families. These, um, these lecture series that they have, you know, who are the people that go? It's usually the same group that would go. You're not reaching beyond that. What I have done in Orange Rock Central, I have started to have neighborhood meetings. This is how you're going to get to the people, one at a time. We had, I invited about 200 people, and just as an attempt, about 35 persons showed up. But there are 35 people that live in that area, and they could ask you in a more personalized, personalized way to get a clear understanding about the pros and the cons of the ICG. That has not happened. Now, we've been told, as I said, clearly before by the Prime Minister, and we'll see what will happen within the court system itself if you get your injunction, um, that the postponement is not going to happen if he's making the decision. We are just shy of a month away. What is going to be the role of the People's United Party well, while the, 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 the challenge works through the court system as we lead up to the referendum vote itself? Well, if the courts say that there's going to be a referendum, obviously you're going to participate. Mm -hmm. And we Are you going know. to be mobilizing supporters? One of the key things, and I remember from covering the uh, Guatemalan referendum from their elections and boundaries uh, department, was that they were very cognizant of the fact that voters are accustomed to parties mobilizing voters to come out. Will you be uh, mobilizing your voters? Well, we don't have the resources. Let's start with that. Um, but we'll do our very best to be able to encourage our supporters to come out. Mm -hmm. And where we can help, we will help. But the resources are limited, and that's why the government has an advantage, or well, the UDP, because as it is right now, mm -hmm. when you look at the people that are out there knocking doors, asking if they want to go and vote, they are UDP operatives, and we know them in every constituency. And then you are telling me that we're making it political? Please, it's government. And now they're even using government taxpayers' money to be able to try to get information that they are going to use for, for their next elections, for municipal um, in village council elections and during elections, and then we should just stand What by. are you talking about, the survey? Of course. What do you think they're going to do that? What do you think they're going to do with that information? It could be a survey to get the pulse of the people. Yeah, that's true. But they will also use it for their own personal use, for their political purposes. Come on. I, 
when you think of how the no camp the no campaign is going there there's the people's united party were saying you know we want to get everything in order before uh, going to a referendum if we have to go on april 10th we'll vote no and then you have an alliance of the third parties the belize peace movement is there going to be an alliance between uh, the People's United Party and the other active no campaign? I haven't met with anyone from, from, the, from the alliance, so I cannot speak they, to that. They're seeking party. the same they, objective as you are. And that's fine. They, they can do their part. We can do our part for, for different reasons, I guess. But, um, but we have not have an alliance with them. Do you separate yourself from their specific no campaign? I don't even really understand what's in no campaign, so I would separate myself with some of the issues that they have made, yes. Mm -hmm. What issues like? Well, some of the outrageous points that they make, and I just leave it as that. Okay. Now, I, I'm just, I'm trying to understand here very clearly. There is a responsibility, I think, that any leader has in being able to guide and educate uh, their supporters um, when you are elected official, you are a representative of the people. You speak of doing your Orange Walk uh, neighborhood parties. What is your message to them? The message to them is the very same thing that we have in the People's Declaration. Mm -hmm. um, in effect, that before we could make the right decision, mm -hmm. we need to be able to address these issues. And they understand. Once you sit down and talk to them mm -hmm. in a small group, they understand that. And they then tend to agree that, yeah, probably it's best to, and to, to address all these issues so that we can get it right. Mm -hmm. Marlene, if you can't get on that register in the, the, the electoral roll um, because they can't find your birth certificate and you are a Belizean, you have a former and, uh, passport that's expired, you have your voter's ID card to show that you have, everybody knows you're a Belizean, and then you can't participate, you can challenge the results of that referendum afterwards. How many voters does the, the PUP have on record who have not been able to? Well, we, we are compiling a, a list and it goes to almost 6,000. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And what are their challenges in getting their voters? They can't get their birth certificates. Primarily the birth certificates. Primarily certificate. they can't get their birth certificates. And by law, well, let, let me take that back. It has been the practice, because I'm not sure about the law. I'm not an attorney. <laughs> The, it has been the practice of the elections and boundaries that you can go and register without your birth certificate. And you take a with. picture and then they vet it. Right now they're telling you they're not vetting. Well, I have a the number of people are saying that. Well, the said otherwise on That's this not show. true. And she said it was I approximately 2,000. I'm telling you what they said I here on television. challenging her. She said it was about 2,000 and that you can do the very same process or practice that you were speaking And of. they refuse. I can give you names that have gone and they're telling them we will not take your applications because you don't have a birth certificate. That has happened in Orange Rock Central. And I told the person, go back. They have to take your, your, your application. And she went back on Saturday and they said, no, you don't have your birth certificate. So something is going wrong between the top and the offices outside of the office of the chief election officer. How do you see the next month playing out? This month leading up to the referendum? <sighs> I had hoped that, um, that the courts would, would stop, would say stop, we need to fix all of this before we proceed. Mm -hmm. So that they can give us time to be able to sit down and, and try to see if we can find or forge a way forward. But even then, Marlene, the problem we're facing now that we're coming too close to the next general elections. So politics is starting to contaminate the process. Why do you think the, 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 um, the referendum unit is using all UDP operatives. They are starting to get ready for the next election. And they're using government money, taxpayers' money, to be able to get that information. So the best, as I, as I mentioned to the Prime Minister, I said, I said, Prime Minister, I believe that if there's a vote right now, we're going to get a no. So what do we want? Do we want a referendum, or do we want to get it right? Why can't the two major political parties come together and announce that the next government, within one year or one year and a half, whatever time they think is necessary, will hold a referendum and we could address all of these issues and we can work together to it? And he said, why? Well, he doesn't want to change the date. So your postponement is not in line with what uh, Senator Courtney is proposing, the deep freeze? Well, that's one of the, the, the issues that were on an idea that was thrown out. 
that if we can't get all of this going, maybe we should continue to find ways to strengthen the relationship between us and, and Guatemala in trade, in culture, in sports, in health, you know, and, and patrolling the, 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 the borders jointly. Um, there, there are many issues. I mean, it's easier said than done. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's easier said than done. But we can try if we cannot get it to the ICG. You said very clearly that you feel that Guatemala is doing better than we are uh, in the public relations internationally. internationally. That also validates one of the points that we've heard very clearly from people who are pushing for a yes vote, that it is very important that Belize agrees to go to the ICG, that we vote yes. Otherwise, Guatemala has a better position to say, look, we are interested in solving this issue and Belize is not. I will not dispute that fact, but the point is that we should have never been where we are right now. From early on, we should have done it. Look at when Guatemala went internationally condemning Belize because we shot one of uh, 13 year old. Unfortunate, the kid was shot. And insisted that we have to bring um, forensic uh, investigators to find out what happened. When the report came out and it clearly demonstrated that it was not the BDF and demonstrated that they were shooting, they were aggressing yeah. our rangers in the Chiqui Bull Forest Reserve and our BDF. Guatemala asked, asked the government not to make that report public. Why on earth are you going to hide that report? The government, the prime minister should have immediately gone to the house, tabled that report and said, this is what happened and gone internationally and let everybody know this is the truth, not what they're saying that they're doing to us. We have never been going across Guatemala to, 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 um, to aggress them. They are the ones who come in, they, they, they steal our natural resources, they come and, and steal in, in the border towns, and then they run across. But you do know, and, and I think it's very clear that people have, have uh, understood that even with a validation of the 1859 treaty, things like incursions don't necessarily change. But it will make it easier to, to, to be able to, to patrol and to take it, to handle it very quick um, uh, and a much efficient and effective. Way. How so? Well, because once you have, um, you got the Guatemala to, to accept the border, then we can easier, we, we could, could patrol it more freely and say, yeah, this is our border, you're in our side, which we have always been in. It is our border and we're not changing our border. Now, there was a recent legal opinion um, commissioned by the Bar Association and most of the legal opinion validates what has been put forward in the prior opinions commissioned by Belize, saying that we do have a strong case. There are points that are made that we do have to ensure we look into our archives properly, um, yeah. but there are- The British and the Spanish- yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and uh, the origin of the claim back into uh, the history with the British, and also a specific look at what is happening in the Sarstoon. This very esteemed uh, professor from the University of West Indies is saying that we have a strong case. Have I said anything different? Have I said that we don't have a strong but case? But if we have a strong case. Have I said that we don't have a strong case? I have never said that. I do believe we have a strong case. I am saying that we are not ready right now we to make not, that decision. So we are not People ready to make, to make a decision. To vote at a referendum to, to get the preferred outcome. We are not ready for the Belizean people to go and vote with the proper information. Whatever the decision they make, we have to respect the will of the people. Yes. And that's where I leave it. So saying that we have a strong case, what I hear from you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that essentially a postponement of the date is to wait until the people feel better informed to vote yes? For the people to make the right decision. If they got all the information that would tell you we need that, that we, we have a strong case, which I believe we have a strong case. I was not surprised by the, by the um, opinion, the legal opinion. And if at the end of the day, if you have given all the facts and the people still vote no, mm -hmm. then we have to respect that. But if we right now, the people go and vote no because they don't have the facts, then I think that's a tragedy for Belize. Mm -hmm. So talk to the people who are watching the show right now, people who are undecided. They're hearing three different things. And it's interesting, in our flashback last time, we went back to uh, the 
what the people thought when the maritime areas bill was being taken to the, to the um, House. And one person, Rene Nunes, actually said, you know, we're hearing three different things and we're confused. People are hearing from the People's United Party, no, let's wait. From the United Democratic Party, yes, let's go. And from the Belize Peace Movement, absolutely no. There are a lot of people out there who don't even want to participate in this process. What do you say to them as one of the representatives, the leader of the opposition of this country, to give them clarity? I believe that the two major parties should make greater effort to be able to work this process, that we should find and make every effort for us to be able to, to keep this as a bipartisan um, effort, getting to the referendum um, and then giving the facts as they are for the people to make the decision whether they feel we should go to the ICG or not. If we can do that, it will clear a lot of the uncertainty in the minds of the people. Unfortunately, that's not the reality. Unfortunately, I strongly believe that the, the government were not serious enough in engaging us in a meaningful way for us to get to the 10th April referendum. And because of those issues, um, where they refuse to listen, where they refuse to listen to, to good suggestions. I mean, at the end of the day, they're the government. But if 10 out of, nine out of 10 recommendations, I mean, you listen to none, I mean, or you only listen to one, I mean, obviously you have no interest in working with us. Mm -hmm. And they cannot say that about us. When we were in government, we had them every single step of the way involved in a meaningful way. Um, Maybe it's a time for, 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 for the government to, to sit back and reflect and realize where are we, just because we say we have to do April 10th, is that's not enshrining stone? The Guatemalans change it three times. Why can't we change it one time so that we can give a chance for this to be properly ventilated, to give a chance to have a good voters' role, to give a chance to have a better discussion where we want the diaspora to be able to vote in this referendum, to give a chance to be able to amend the Maritime Areas Act, to give a chance to correct the issue of the referendum act, to give a chance to, to correct the People's Representation Act. You know, there's a lot of work to be done. And I've been saying this from 2016, whenever I met the Prime Minister and even if the Foreign Minister, we have a lot of work and I don't see that happening. It's only this last print that now we're seeing they're all over the place, like uh, fans, all over the place. And what, are they being effective? I'm not sure. Right. Closing point. Well, first of all, um, um, Marlene, thank you again for having me here to be able to, uh, to try to clarify some of the issues. Mm -hmm. It's an explosive issue, it's an emotional issue, and it is very difficult to just to be factual with people because they are going to take it whichever way you want. And I can ask the Belizean people at this time, take your time, study what's in front of you, look at the issues, look at what we, we are confronting getting to, the, to, to have the referendum because we have all of these issues that need to be corrected, and if they believe that we are right, then they need to go and, and, and say and vote no because we are not ready to make this momentous decision. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and discussing all these issues. And of course, as you stated earlier in the show, uh, we're expecting to see uh, a filing at the court on uh, the <coughs> challenge to the special agreement, right? Yes. Okay, today. thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by the Belize City Council to talk about their anniversary. So stay tuned.